Hello, year six. Welcome to Friday's story time. Uh, we're on chapter 11, Sky Circus. Now, in chapter 10, we realized that the Madame Lion's Mane had some link to Lily, and now we know why they wanted to capture her. Lily clutched her coat close around her as Madame pushed her and Malkin out of the gondola and marched them along its side through a short stretch of scrubby grass. Madame, Lily realized, had plans for her and Malkin, but Robert seemed surplus to requirement. She tried very hard not to worry about what might happen to him, left alone in the cargo bay with Swim Slimwood. There was no way she or Malkin could help him right now. All she could do was examine their surroundings. If they wanted to attempt an escape, she needed to recall every landmark. The men who chased them last night were busily uh, erecting the site's high circular perimeter fence. The kiosk and spike-topped gates set into it were being locked tight. Lily was starting to think about think that the whole setup was not just to keep gate crashers and busybodies out, but also to keep the performers in. They arrived at another door hatch on the port side of the ground skyship. Madame opened it and shoved them inside into a stairwell. Malkin bristled with anger and growled through his teeth, but there was a little, but there was little he could do from within the muzzle. Lily put a calming hand on his head and looked about. What little light there was came from the electric lamps that ran along the walls, pulsing in a vague rhythm that matched their stuttering heartbeat. This way, Madame said, and they followed her up a set of steps. The end of Lily's tiger-striped scarf dragged behind her. She thought about tying a loose thread, it, a thread from it to the banister, like Ariadne, so she could find her way back. They reached the next landing, and Madame forced them along a narrow labyrinth passage filled with numbered closed cells. They came to a padlocked barred gate that spanned the width of the passageway. Beyond it stood a single door. It looked heavier than the others and was studded with rivets. Two large bolts secured a hatch in its centre that was stenciled with the number 13. Voila, Saltres. Unlucky for some, or in this case, you, Lily. Madame took a ring of keys from a hook on her belt and flicked through them until she found one that fitted the padlock. She opened it and hustled Lily and Malkin through the gate, locking it behind her. Now, empty your pockets. I want everything, including the red notebook. Lily made a show of searching through her coat and her pockets. She didn't want to give Madame Mama's notebook. If only there was something else she could hand over instead. Then she found Malkin's birthday present. This is all I have, she said, grasping the deceased mouse in her fist and holding it out. Donnez la moi. Give it to me. Madame opened her palm and Lily dropped the dead rodent into it. She expected at least a scream, but the woman merely tutted and threw the mouse away. The rest, s'il vous plaît, Madame commanded. There's nothing else, Lily replied. Liar, monteur. Madame grasped her arm and pushed her coat aside, patting her down. When she felt the red notebook nestled against Lily's back, she gave a victorious cry of delight. Voila, here it is. Madame tussled the, the book free, but Lily was having none of it. She shot out her hand and clasped it by the pages. That's mine, she said, through gritted teeth. You may have stolen it from Papa, but you're not stealing it from me. We shall see. Madame pulled sharply at the spine, and there was a horrible ripping sound. The clump of pages Lily was clutching tore from the binding and crumpled in her hand. Now look, Madame said, you've ruined a perfectly good book. She flicked through the remainder of it. I imagine you've read some. How did you find it? I must tell you, I thought your mother's writing rather dull. Très annoyeux. Perhaps the loss isn't so great after all. Lily's eyes narrowed. She clutched the crushed paper in her fist and bit her tongue to stop the tears. She half expected that Madame might try and prize the torn section from her fingers, but the woman was obviously bored of the whole confrontation, for she snapped the book closed and waved Lily away with a flick. Keep those scraps. I shouldn't imagine they contain anything of value. Consider it a consolation prize. Hello. She found the key to room 13 and inserted it into the lock. Pushing the door open, she shoved Malkin and Lily inside, and then, with a heavy clunk, the door slammed shut behind them. Afterwards, there was just the click of the lock, the clang of the padlock on the gate, and then Madame's footsteps walking away. Lily sank to the floor, blind with rage, and laid the torn sheaf 
of papers across her lap, smoothing each leaf, flat, and trying to calm the ball of anger inside. It was only a book. It shouldn't hurt so badly. But at this moment, it felt like the largest pain there was, as if Madame had ripped Mad Mama from her, pulled the pieces of the past apart, and stood there sneering. Now, Lily would never be able to finish reading M Mama's story. She destroyed it, Malkin. She gasped, tears blurring her vision. Malkin gave a soft, wheezy yap in reply. Lily glanced down to see he was still wearing the muzzle. Oh, I, I'm sorry, she said. I, I forgot. She pulled him to her chest and released the buckle from the back of his head. How are you feeling, anyway? The fox licked the teardrops from her face with a dry tongue. Oh, just tickety-boo. That was some welcome from your old friend. She's no friend of mine. Lily gave a loud, sorrowful sniff. Malkin, we have to get out of here. You need to help me make a plan. She brushed the tears from her face with shaking fingers and took in room 13. It was windowless, four-berth cabin, with thick metal walls. What little light there was came from a blinking electric bulb set into the ceiling. A small table stood at the centre of the room, a rickety-looking chair pushed underneath it. In the corner was an old tin bucket and a vanity screen, painted with stars, against which leaned a walking stick. What is all this stuff? Lily asked. She had expected another sarcastic reply, but Malkin had gone quiet. Don't look now, he whispered at last, but I think we're surrounded. And with a curdling sense of unease, Lily realised he was right. Take off that coat and penguin suit, Slimwood commanded, jamming Robert's arm even higher up, his, up behind his back until his nerves jangled with pain. You look like you're about to go in uh, on a mag magic review. What should I wear then? Robert replied, grinding his jaw with a loud whimper. Slimwood let go of his arm and tossed him the laundry sack he'd been carrying. There's clothes in there. You want me to change in front of all these folk? Robert asked. For by now the cargo bay was swarming with people, flooding up and down the lo loading ramp like ants. Yes. Slimwood gave him a stinging swipe round the ear that knocked his cap off his head. We've rules around here, and the first is don't talk back. He folded his arms and turned away. Robert emptied the contents of the laundry bag onto the floor and started to undress. His heart wrenched as he took off his dar's coat. It was the only thing he had of his, but he hadn't lost it yet, and whatever happened, he would get it back. This he vowed. He folded the coat carefully and put it in the bag, and then he started to remove his shoes and socks. He could have sworn Slimwood had said that there were no rules in the circus, but that had been the jovial ringmaster in the show. This Slimwood was different, far more unpleasant. It seemed as if his charm was something he could turn on and off at will, like a water tap. As Robert unbuttoned his shirt, cold air drifted in from outside the cargo bay, pinching his skin. But his ears burned, and he felt only hot with embarrassment. Beneath his vest, the moon locket glinted against his breastbone. He turned away to hide it from view, but it was too late. Slimwood had seen it. I'll take that, if you don't mind, he said, grabbing it. It was rather valuable. Robert felt a spike of anguish as Slimwood yanked the locket away from his neck. Careful, he wanted to shout, but the clasp on the chain had snapped. The locket came loose in Slimwood's hands, and the ringmaster examined it before putting it in his pocket. The second rule is no jewellery, and the third rule is anything contraband you thought belonged to you now belongs to me. Robert felt sick. It was the only thing he had of his Mars. A handful of men and women in linen shirts and thick woolen breeches spattered with mud bustled behind him, ignoring this injustice. Together they worked to remove the wheel blocks from beneath the carnivore's cage and wheel it out. Robert took off his trousers and stood there in his cotton vest and woolen drawers. More people arrived. They pulled heavy bags and boxes from their shelves and carried them down the ramp on their shoulders. None of them looked him in the eye. In the far corner of the, ho of the horse stall, a boy and a girl were tending to the two stallions. Robert recognised them from the show as Silver Buttons, the gymnast, and Dimitri, the youngest horseman of the apocalypse. Silver wore a red-spotted neckerchief, and Dimitri sported leather riding boots. He didn't look apocalyptic today, more run down and tired, which was how Robert felt too. Dimitri stroked the horse's manes and whispered to them softly, which Silver bought them water in a bucket. All the while glancing sidelong at Robert. When she noticed Slimwood, she tried to look twice as busy as she already was. Don't dawdle, boy. Slimwood snapped at Robert. Get on with it. 
Bobbitt picked up the clothes from the bag. They looked the same brown and grey colour as everybody else's and smelled of dirt and damp. When he climbed into the trousers, their coarse material itched against his skin. He buttoned up his rough shirt. He missed the cold feel of the moon locket against his skin. He folded the last of his clothes neatly and put them in the laundry bag. And the cap, Subwood said. You won't be needing that again where you're going. It's a smart cap for a smart boy. And stupid's more your style. Subwood laughed at his own joke, his gold teeth flashing once more. With a heavy heart, Robert did as he was told. His cap was like an extra limb to him. When he was done, Subwood seized the bag from him and threw it into a basket in the corner, piled high with identical sacks. Then he took Robert by the elbow and steered him down the cargo ramp. Outside, the morning sun was warming, the last of the dew from the grass of a scrubby clearing surrounded by a spiked fence. It didn't look anything like Robert had imagined Paris. Some of the circus folk, the bigger, burlier men, who chased them last night, were busy with sledgehammers, driving stakes into the ground in a big circle. Others, people from the show, were sorting through the bags and trunks, bringing out rolls of canvas. Some would watch their progress, proprietorily. Anyone slow in their work got a lash from his whip. You'll help to set the site today, he told Robert, as they skirted a figure struggling to unwind a big ball of guy rope. Mostly you'll assist in putting up the big top. It needs to be erected by evening so we can start rehearsals for the new show tomorrow. Understand? Uh, Robert st said. Good. Someone dug his fingers into Robert's elbow and Robert winced in pain. Everyone here gets three chances. He led Robert away from the busy crew, off round the front of the skyship, past the wooden angel figurehead. If you're back chat earlier and you're hiding of valuables, you're down to two strikes. But work hard, don't ask questions or play games and we'll get along fine. Run, hide, stir up shady activity or incite trouble in my crew and I'll have your guts for garters. And I don't mean that metaphorically. He pointed out a row of items hung from hooks on the gondola's starboard side. See those? What do you think they are? Robert shook his head. He had no idea. He stared at the things. There was an old battered clown hat with its pom-poms missing, a burned-looking spangled leotard, a set of stirrups, five juggling clubs in a, on a rope, which jangled together in the wind, and what seemed to be a human thigh bone and a wrinkled elephant's foot. Someone slapped this last item with their palm. They're mementos, he explained. Relics and trophies of troublemakers past. Circus acts who mysteriously disappear. He sniggered to himself. I keep them to remind my crew's boss and what happens to any black guard who crosses me. Robert felt sick. He stared fearfully up at the line of grim remains. Whatever happened, he didn't want to end up like those poor souls. He had to find Lily and Malkin as soon as he could and escape. I remember, some would say, escorting him back round to the busy side of the gondola. You've only one let strike left. I'm a fair master in the ring and out. Too fair, madame says. That's my way. You know the rules. So if and when the crunch comes, you can't say you won't warn. He paused and let Robert digest the last bit of information. Robert imagined he'd made this vile speech a thousand times before. The lunk will be along in a minute to assign you your chores. I suggest you do as he says. And then Slimwood stalked off to shout at someone who wasn't banging stakes into his liking. Robert remained in the shadows. He was hollow inside, and his skin felt as thin as eggshell, as if any second now it might crack open and an overwhelming feeling of fear would come flooding out. He wished he hadn't lost his Mars locket. At least he had the rest of the things. He shoved his hands in his pockets and realised with horror that his penknife and pencil and the lockpicks were all missing. How could he be so stupid? He'd left them in his dad's jacket in a laundry bag along with a dozen or more identical others, somewhere in the hold. How could he possibly find Lily and Malkin and get them out now? Lily's legs shook beneath her as she stared into the dark recesses of room 13. I can't see any more, she whispered nervously. They're in here somewhere, Malkin replied. She took a few steps forward, peering into each of the four berths in return. Malcolm was right, though the first bunk was unoccupied, save for some folded bedding. The other three were most definitely not. A set of worried eyes shone out from each of them, three figures, staring from beneath their blankets. They must have hidden when they'd heard Madame bringing her and Malkin along the passage. What were they so frightened of that they had to conceal themselves in their beds? Lily and Malkin waited in silence, not knowing what to say, until finally a soft girlish voice from the top left hand bunk spoke. Who's that girl in the tiger-striped scarf, Luca? 
She's not one of us. No, came the gruff answer from the bunk beneath. She's most certainly not, and neither is her scruffy orange dog. Then Luca the lobster boy threw off his blanket and jumped to the floor, clacking his metal claws together. Had a good look, have you? he jeered, lurching towards her. Come to stare at the freaks. So, end of chapter 11. So Malkin and Lily have been locked up with the other hybrids, as they refer to them in the book. We'll have to see what happens in chapter 12 on Monday. Thank you very much for joining me. Take care.